Hello. Um, thanks for attending this talk. Uh, just to give you a little bit of introduction, uh, today we're going to kind of try to learn how to build a functional reactive application using um, Node.js and InfiniSpan. So we're going to start a little bit with some definitions to find out why we are interested in doing this at all. And then we're going to be looking at how to build like a little demo reactive application. And uh, I'll be doing some live coding. So if after my sacrifices to my demo gods, then it all should be fine if I killed enough uh, lambs and things like that. So cross your fingers. Um, um, so yeah, as uh, uh, I've, been, I've already been presented, just uh, I work uh, Red Hat with, and then within Red Hat, uh, JBoss division, so the middleware, Java middleware area. Um, uh, one of the uh, co-founders of InfiniSpan, which is an in-memory data grid, and we're going to be using a bit, seeing a bit of it today. I currently lead the client-server architecture. I uh, write code in multiple languages, uh, Java, Scala, JavaScript, Haskell, and lately I've been playing with them. And um, I got very interested in uh, languages that promote functional programming, because I think it's a very neat way of uh, programming. Uh, if you want to find out more about myself, uh, I'm on Twitter. And then if you have any comments about the talk, whether it's good, bad, horrible, uh, just use the InfiniSpan hashtag. I won't, I won't blame you. Um, so before I go, I wanted to know a little bit about yourself. So um, how many of you are Spanish? So it's probably about just over half, I would say. Uh, how many of you are Node.js developers? How many of you are Java developers? Uh, how many of you have written Haskell before? OK, so a few. So, so there seems to be a lot of Java developers. A uh, few Haskell, Haskellers, so hopefully I'll be able to cut it for everyone. So, so the, today's object is to learn how to build functional reactive applications. So the first thing to wonder about is, OK, what is a functional reactive uh, application? Well, ba that basically is a, an application written following the functional reactive programming principles, so what we call is FRP. Um, now, the problem with FRP in general is that it's quite an abstract concept. And if you go to Google or Stack Overflow, you'll find a lot of people asking, hey, what's, what's this FRP thing? What, what, is, what is it about? Um, so the way I like to explain it is to split the question into two parts. First of all, we want to find out what is functional reactive programming in, in the terms of what is its definition. So if you go to Wikipedia, what, what does it tell you? And the other thing is uh, why FRP is interesting. What is it useful for? So in terms of the definition, FRP essentially means it's a, it's a composable declarative way of programming with time varying values. OK? Um, so the composable declarative way is what gives you the functional part of, uh, of the code. And then reacting to value changes over time is what gives you the reactive part. So the functional part means we want to try to uh, structure our code in such that it shows a bit like this. So you've got, you take some input, you transform that input, and then you kind of produce some output, OK? And then the output then becomes the input for something else. So you can kind of, kind of start chaining up things. Now, if you take this diagram and then we kind of add the reactive part of it, what we end up being is like our input can be is normally some kind of event, something that's happened, along with a state. So, what is your current state of your application? Then within it, you transform it. You produce. You can either say you produce a new state as a result, maybe of receiving an update, or maybe you produce an event. For example, if you're clicking in a button, then maybe you send like an HTTP request. But everything that you do is kind of shaped in this way. Now, why is FRP interesting? And this is kind of where it gets interesting. The, on one side, the fact that we try to write our code in a functional, composable way means it's easier to reason about the complex interactions of our code. Um, and the other interesting thing is that FRP is designed to be asynchronous by default. So at no point you actually waiting for things to happen. So all you do is whatever is going on, you take your input, you transform it, you produce an output. So you, uh, you're always asynchronous by default, which means that you take better, uh, you make better use of your resources. There's no kind of threats or logs be waiting to happen.
So I think the best way to learn how to build a functional reactive application is to actually go and use one and uh, create one that follows these principles. Um, so I've created this little application that shows upcoming Infinispan related conference talks. So things, uh, user groups, conference talks, where me or some of my colleagues are going to be uh, um, presenting. So what it's going to allow us to do is to show those events that are at the moment coming up. Uh, we'll be able to introduce one. We'll be able to search through events, etc. And this application is basically going to be a three-tier application when we've got a front-end here that is going to be our kind of web app. That's going to be talking via HTTP to a kind of middle layer, a Node.js middle layer. And then in the back end, that's going to be talking to Infinispan, which is going to be our kind of uh, data store. So le let's try to look at each layer in the individually to, to understand a bit better. So on the front end, what we have is Elm, an application that is written in Elm. Elm is essentially an statically compiled language. Um, and that's quite interesting. It's like you're trying to use a statically compiled language for the front end. Um, and actually, this, that is really cool because I've come from the background of statically typed languages. And I like the fact that a statically typed language allows me to catch mistakes early on. It also helps my development because we have types, so you can actually check the documentation. And in general, refactoring becomes much easier. Now, what do we use M for? In general, it's used for building user interfaces for the web. That's its primary target. Um, it's, a f it's a purely functional programming language, so it, it means that it guarantees there is no mutations or side effects, and it promotes functional reactive, princi uh, functional reactive programming principles. So we've got a statically compiled uh, language. What does it compile to? JavaScript. And that's the cool thing about it. It, it, it enables you to create JavaScript that, that uh, performs better than things like Angular, React, or Ember. Now, one of the things that M is really known for is its compiler. It's got probably the most helpful error messages from a compiler that you see in the industry. And there is always this feeling about M that if it compiles, it typically just works, even after you've done some serious refactoring, which means that uh, it makes it, in general, much easier to evolve than, uh, than other, other uh, alternative options for building frontends. And one of the cool things is that it doesn't produce any runtime errors or exception. I'm yet to see one. I have not seen one. I mean, if you're doing, for example, JavaScript, you probably have seen uh, undefined is not a function. So this is kind of like the anything can happen. You've forgotten a parameter, you've made a mistake, etc. Now, in the middle, what I have here is just a simple a stateless layer, which is based in Node.js. Uh, it's, it's a very minimalist uh, layer that uses exp Express.js, which is a, a little web framework for Node.js. Um, now, the thing about Node.js is that it's not a, uh, a language that explicitly uh, promotes functional reactive programming. However, it's async event-based nature. It means that uh, it enables you to easily build functional reactive applications. The only problem is that you need to be very disciplined in the way you code. So you need to avoid doing mutations or side effects in a way that is going to mess up things. So this particular layer is going to be listening on port 3000 for our demo. Uh, and um, what it's going to be doing then is going to be talking via a binary protocol with our backend, which is the Infinispan layer. So what do we have in the backend? We've got uh, Infinispan, which is an in-memory data grid. Uh, which uh, it's an open source project that uh, we started about seven or eight years ago. Um, it's a Apache license, so it's uh, completely uh, free. Um, and here for our demo, what we're going to have is we're going to have a ser three server domain, so where we're going to be able to maintain two copies for each data. So the idea is that even if there is a failure, when the cluster rebalances, they won't be able to continue working. Um, you can talk to Infinispan from m multiple languages, whether it's Java, uh, C, C++, C Sharp, Python, Ruby, Node.js, like, like here. And then from a FRP perspective, one of the cool things we added in the last uh, year or two years is we added the ability to attach remote listeners. So it means that 
As your data changes in the backend, you can attach remote listeners to find out what's changed. Okay, so if there is new entries coming in, you'll get an event. If there is any changes to the data, you'll get an event, etc. And that is quite a, I consider it a very FRP friendly architecture. Now, this talk, um, mostly the demo mostly focuses on the M part because that's kind of the, the big driver in this application. So to understand the demo, I wanted to a little bit explain uh, explain you a little bit some of the concepts around Elm. Um, so here at the top, um, Elm in general looks a bit like Haskell. Uh, it's pretty close to Haskell. So if you know Haskell, you're probably familiar with this code. See, there is a lot of Java and Node.js people, so you probably be a little bit foreign. So let me go through it. So here we've got a type alias. Type alias is like your definition. Model is our state. So our state says, I've got a list or a string, or I've got, this is my state. And the, this alias here defines what is, what is my state uh, comprised of. Then here model, we basically say, what is the initial value for our state? And this is what we call a function, where a function that returns a, a, an instance of model, basically. And then here we basically define what our initial state is. Now, the way M works is that anything that can happen in your application is uh, defined by this kind of type message. And here, this is uh, what we call uh, a union type. So it means anything, any event your application can handle uh, basically is, is uh, mapped here. So you've got clicks, uh, receiving HTTP responses, typing into a field, anything. It's all, it's, it's all captured here. Then, the update function is, the, uh, is here is where we get the event, the state, and then we, design, we define what we want to produce. This is like our kind of the central, kind of the core of the application. So we say, if we get a click, then we're going to do something. If we get a response from our HTTP server, we're going to do this, etc. And here at the, at the bottom, we've got a view uh, method that basically uh, takes a model as input and returns an HTML that can produce events. So to understand a little bit better, uh, I produced this uh, sequence diagram here. So with M, there is this thing called the M runtime. So your job is to define these functions, and then M itself will make sure that it invokes them. Okay. So let me let me go through an example so that you understand. So M starts takes the model, the initial value you've given it, and it passes on to the view function. The view function is your, your way to say, this is my model, and I produce, this is the HTML that I want it to produce. So then you return an HTML, and here, within the HTML, you say, oh, I've got this button, and it can produce a click. And if I click, this is the event that is going to be create, generating. So then the user goes into a website, and then types a click. Then Elm Runtime captures that, and takes the click along with the current state, and it calls your update function. So it goes onto here, and then in your you say, okay, I received a click. So what do I need to do? Say in my example, I need to send some data over to via HTTP. So I say, okay, the model stays the same because I'm not updating anything. But this command here, I'm going to be using it as a way to send, hey, send this HTTP send a re request. And when you get the response, this is the event that you, that you are going to fire. Then when the server returns, it returns you with uh, uh, the event that you said it, it will fire when it receives the response. And it will take the state and call you again. So then you say, OK, I've received the response from the server. This is the state. And you might say, OK, now I need to update my state. So what I do, I return an updated state here. And then M decides, hey, I've got a new state. So what do I need to do? I need to call the view function, because the view function is the one that is going to present to me the new state. So this is how it, how it all works together. And this is what we are going to be kind of looking at. So, so far, so good. So, the first uh, demo that I'm going to show you is what happens when our front end starts. When it starts, it basically sends an HTTP request, a GET request uh, on dash events to the middle layer. Um, the middle layer in turn is going to say, okay, give me all the upcoming events that are happening, all the conference talks. And then 
the backend is basically going to asynchronously send those back to the Node.js middleware, which in turn then is going to uh, bounce them into a JSON array and it's going to ship it back to the front end. Okay? So we're going to see a little bit that in action now. Okay, so I'm switching off to mirror displays because I can't code and look at the screen at the same time, so it's a bit easier for me. Right, um, right. let me show you first things first. Uh, what do we have at the moment? Okay, uh, to, 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 to. what is this going? Hold on a sec, because this, this, this is gone somewhere else. It's gone a little bit. Uh, where are you going to? Hold on. Huh? No, that's that's fine. It's just uh, I was trying to kind of uh, get these two to be together. Okay. Yeah, I think that's. Oh, doesn't want to do. Okay. Um. So. Let me show you. Uh, so here, I, I'll, I'll go between the screens. So here I've got my, um, oops. So I wanted to kind of show you one b side by side, okay? So I've got here my data grid, which is formed of three nodes. What I wanted to do is I wanted to show you the side by side, the two screens, but uh, for some reason I cannot do that right now. And then what I have here is my my website as it is at the moment, okay? So what I want to do here is present to you the uh, the events that are already in the system. So the first thing that I need to do is if I go, this is um, uh, my, okay, so can you see? Uh, this is essentially what my application, my Elm application looks like. So I've got some imports here. Uh, which uh, not going to talk too much about them at the moment. Then I've got my HTML here. Uh, uh, this is my starting point where I say, this is my init function, my view function, uh, my update function. We also use uh, subscriptions, but I'll show you later on. And here we've got our type alias. So for this fir first talk, we're interested in about these two parts. This is, we've got a maybe of a list of conference talks. Um, basically, when I start, uh, maybe it's a type that gives you either something or nothing. When I start my applications, I don't yet have any uh, conference talks in my system, so I have nothing. Now, once I've sent the HTTP request to the backend and I fetch it, I will have something and then a list of whether one, zero, or n uh, talks. And then I've also got oops, uh, some errors to show here. Okay. Now. Here is our initial state, so this is what I was saying. This is our initial state, which is nothing, and I don't yet have errors. Now, what we want to do is, we want to kind of implement, we already say that at the start of our application, we're going to have this initial model. And what I want to do is send a request to the backend to, uh, take the, uh, to bring in the servers. So how do I do that with them? Um, just so that you know, I've got in the back end a webpack configuration for them. So whenever I make any changes here, it will recompile it for me. So I don't need to be kind of compiling all the time. So let's just do, uh, first of all, I'm going to be defining a local variable. So that's, this is what let allows you to do. I'm saying localhost 3000 events. Okay, that's my. So what do I need to do with uh, this uh, URL? So I need to do an HTTP send. And I'm going to do an HTTP get request for the URL. And then I'm going to be saying, whenever I get any talks, I'm going to be decoding them. So for anyone that doesn't understand, uh, doesn't know Haskell, uh, a space is like your function applications. So for example, here, for anyone that comes from Java, here what I'm doing is calling the HTTP get method, passing URL and tax decoder as parameters. So for anyone doing Java, this would be equivalent to doing this. But function application is so common in uh, Haskell that uh, uh, that's too verbose. So that's why they use the, uh, the space kind of pattern, where space is everything. Space is kind of like your magic thing. 
Um, now, there is something missing here. I'm going to send an HTTP GET request, but as I said before, I need to say, hey, what is the event that is going to fire when it gets the, gets the response? And here I've got something called talks. Now, talks here is going to be an, um, so let me make it a bit smaller so that you see. So talks is one of these options that can happen here. The type message is just kind of like different events that uh, I can deal with. So this is going to be an HTTP a result that is either going to be a list of conference talks or an HTTP error. Okay, so how do I then deal with this in my update function? So in my update function, the way it works is this. I've got either, when I get uh, the HTTP request, I'm either gonna get the talks that have been decoded. So from JSON, they've been converted into this, uh, uh, into talks, which is, uh, let me see, uh, if you go to the model, it's going to be this kind of list of conference talks. And if not, it's going to be an HTTP error where I'm going to be just showing it. Okay, so okay, I've implemented. I think I've got everything now. So let's go back to our website. Okay, oops, see here a network error. Okay, so what I've done here, I've started with my front end and my server, but I've basically left out. I didn't start my middle layer on top, so that you can see what, what happens, like how you deal with HTTP errors. So what I need to do to get this working is I need to start my... Uh, I need to start my middle layer, so if I go back here, I can restart, and now I see my middle layer is now, and then my middle layer basically takes care of inserting some talks, and now I can show them here, okay? Now, what happens, one of the things I said is that it's got a very useful uh, compiler errors, right? So let's see what happens if I misspell things, okay? So let's go and see the compiler, see what it tells you. Haha, uh -huh. okay, it tells me that, um, hmm, what is it saying? It's like, oop, uh, oops. The record fields do not matter. Maybe you made one of these typos. I did not typo. Yeah, okay. Right, I said before that whenever we deal with uh, an event, like uh, an HTTP event, I need to deal with the okay and the error. What happens if I forget to deal with the error, for example? Okay, so I'm going to comment this line. What happens? Well, let's see what it tells us. It says, hey, you need to account for the following values. It's telling me, hey, I need to deal with the error. I cannot just not deal with the error. So it's good. It kind of it's helping me program in the in the right way. Um what happens if I for example um uh, 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 let's see what we can do. Um uh, yeah, I think that that's pretty pretty good for now. Okay? Um so now I've got already got my talks here. So if I go to my data grid now, uh, if I concede, I see now, this is my data grid. So you see these dots now, they've got like little dots on top of them. Here, and then this, oops, okay. So you see there's two dots here, right? And this one doesn't have any dots around it. That's because I said, we've configured our data grid to keep two copies of the data. So obviously these two dots here, basically showing me the two pieces of data that are around. Okay, so this is kind of a nice way of representing the data grid that we use so that uh, it's good for live demos, basically. Okay, the idea is I wanted to show the two, the web app and this the next uh, side by side, but uh, it's not working. Right, let's get cracking to with our... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Right. Okay, so let's go to the next demo. Next, what we're going to be doing is we're going to see what happens when we want to insert a new talk. So basically, okay, I know one of my colleagues is going to speak next month. I want to add it to, to our system. So what's going to happen is we're going to have uh, one of the front ends. Is going we're going to have like a little dialogue. I'm going to be sending. Uh, we're going to be clicking through it, and we're going to be sending that data over to the middle layer. The middle layer then is going to be calling the backend to insert that uh, that uh, event, and then the backend is basically going to tell us, "Hey, was it inserted? Yes, no," and then. 
one of the things I've done here is I've created, when the middle layer starts, it creates a remote listener with uh, the backend. So it means that when we update something in the backend, this is going to generate an event here. And then we're going to then use the, the event for a couple of things. We're going to then ship that event over WebSockets to the any, any clients that are connected. So it means that whenever we make any updates to the backend, we can kind of fire them after the event over to any connected clients, which is very nice. But at the same time, it gives us a very natural, a very like reactive way of dealing with changes. So instead of me uh, in the front end saying, okay, uh, I've sent the click, now I need to update my state, I say, okay, no, no, let's, let's let it, all the state be updated in the backend, and the backend tell us when it's updated the state so that I can update it myself in my own uh, originating web application. Okay, so what we're going to see is how these uh, how these pieces come together. Uh, back to mirror in this place. Okay, voila. Right. So the first thing that we need to do now is um, let's go to the view function. This is our main view function, okay? This is the one that basically shows us all the, that says, okay, these are the events upcoming, I want you to show them. And then what we need to do is first thing first, we need to uh, uncomment the dialog that allows us, us to insert any events. So if we do that now, then if we go to our web application, oops, where's, here. So we had our initial events and now we see our little dialog. Okay, so we've got a dialog. Obviously, to speed up things, I've already inserted some pre-data so that I, I don't have to type that myself, okay? But, okay, so we can present it. The next thing that we need to do is we need to say, hey, uh, we have dialog and there is a click button. So how are we going to deal with this um, click? So this is, when there is a click, so let me, uh, so that you see that. So here is our HTML, like how are we defining, and we're saying there is a button here, and then on click, this is going to fire insert to click. And insert to click, again, is one of these type of messages that we need to deal with, okay? So whether it's an HTTP response or a click, they're all modeled in the same way. It's an event, okay? So if we go to our update function, we see that our in insert to click here is empty. Okay, so we need to do something here because we're saying um, we send in the model stays the same, but what we need to do is we need to do perform insert talk, and what we need to be doing is we need to be passing it the uh, uh, the model. No, um, yeah, we need to t pass it the model. The model is our state, but what we need to do is we need to kind of convert it into JSON because that's what the the backend layer is going to do. So it's going to be uh, this is basically we call it insert talk as JSON, which basically takes the model and returns us an HTTP body of the formatted JSON, okay? So this is just JSON encoding, basically, how, how you would go about it. Um, oops, 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 all right, maybe better. So, um, yeah, okay, so we've gone, uh, we now have the ability to perform the insert talk. What does perform insert talk? This is pretty much the same that we did earlier except that instead of doing an HTTP GET, we're sending an HTTP POST, we're sending it to a URL. What are we sending? We're sending the talk, the HTTP body that we created. And then, obviously, when it uh, comes back out of inserting, it will tell us whether true or false, whether the event was inserted. And then this is what the decode inserted talk. It, it converts that JSON into our own model. Uh, and then they, uh, we see here what the URL is, okay? So we've got, uh, we know how to send the, we, we, uh, we've basically show you the, uh, um, the dialogue, we've shown you how to send the request, but there's one missing bit here, and that is the, what I was saying before about the subscription. So at the beginning, if you remember, I told you that we've got the init, which is our init, kind of uh, function, we got the view, we got the update, and we got something called subscriptions, okay? So this is where we define what does our application listen to that comes from the outside. And this is where, this is a very good example of this is what you do with WebSockets. So you say, I want to listen uh, to WebSockets, and I'm gonna be do doing it over WS uh, localhost 3000, 
event. And then when we get a new event through a WebSocket event, what are we going to do? We're going to be basically firing yet another event, new talk. Okay, so when we go to new talk, this is what we, again, it's another event. This is like WebSocket event. So what happens when we receive a new talk? Uh, basically, we take that new talk and we append it to the ones that are here. So we, here is basically saying take the model and update the talks to append this new talk that you just received, essentially. Okay, so with that, we should be having our little application. So. <coughs> we have here our talk, so what we need to do is uh, see if it works. So let's uh, insert it. So we've got uh, inserted, and we see that our state has been uh, updated automatically. Um, I forgot, obviously, to, to add a new other window so that you see the WebSockets, but essentially it's the same. So we've been able to kind of fire it through WebSockets. Okay? Um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to show. So let's go back. Okay. So the final demo that I wanted to show to, to you today is I wanted to show you that we can also, so we've been able to create and we can have uh, been able to fetch some talks. So next we're going to do a little bit, uh, we want to do a bit of searching. Okay, so search. Um, Basically, that's going to enable us to have like a little uh, dialogue and search for some data about the talks, right? So what it, the front end is going to do is going to send another GET request with a, to the search endpoint, and we're going to be passing our query along. Um, the, this in the back end is going to be basically executing a remote uh, kind of a, a remote script that we created and we put it into Infinispan, which allows us to do some searching. Uh, we actually have plans to add querying uh, support for Node.js, but at the moment that's not yet in place. So uh, kind of this kind of remote script execution is a kind of a neat way to do the things that are not yet available in the in the client. Then this in turn is going to return you some results which are which talks match that query, and those are going to be uh, sent back to the 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 front end. So let's go back. So we're back here. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to go and have our query. We want to visualize it, okay? So this basically is going to enable us to uh, view the dialogue to enter our query and solve the result, okay? So let's go back to our talk. So we had two talks. I'm, gi I'm giving one next month in Berlin, and we got Sane, which is one of my colleagues, is going to give it one in uh, Copenhagen. Now let's go, we see now, we see our search talk. Now let's look for, say, Sane. And I'm like, something's not right. Okay, so I've looked for Sane. So I, I'm getting the Sane, but I'm also seeing my talk. Huh. So imagine that I'm, I'm not the developer, I'm one of the QE testing. So one of the cool things they added in Elm is like, they have this thing of, because everything is an event in Elm, you can actually, whatever you're doing with the front end, you can actually export it, okay? And then you can basically take this file, send it to your developer, and the developer can basically reload the steps that you did and how you arrived at the, at the UI and be able to replicate what you see. So this is kind of like a way to kind of take debugging to the next level. So instead of me having to explain to the developer how I, how I replicated this issue, I'm like, okay, I have no idea how this application works, but you know what I can do? There's this thing called export here that allows me to export this bit into bug, okay? I call it bug, okay? So now I'm now the developer, and basically someone's telling me, hey, you've got a bug in your application. And I'm like, no, my application is perfect. I write perfect code. Come on, you've got to be kidding me. I'm like, look, look at this file. Okay, I need to go and import this bug. I'm like, okay, it's probably, it's probably done something wrong. It's probably it has no idea. Okay, so I go and say, hmm, okay, so, hmm. I'm like, uh, let, let me explore the history. So, so I, I see that it's got uh, talks okay. I know, I can see that it's been typing sane. Okay, so it's been typing into the field. But I'm looking around, I'm like, well, my query is empty. 
Uh -huh. So there's a bug in the application. <laughs> so what it's going on is I'm typing, but I'm not, I'm not actually updating the query. So what happens is sending the empty query. The empty query then is, it matches everything. This is why I'm seeing the wrong results. OK, all right, I know what's the problem. <laughs> uh, I think I forgot to update my haha. Whenever I type something, I get an event here. So whenever I type each individual, you see how you get query talk, query talk, query talk with a value and update. And this is basically coming here. But haha, uh -huh, I think I know what the problem is. I forgot to update the, the state to have the query be this one. Uh -huh. So now if I uh, go back to my application, I say, hey, I think I've, oops, why is it not? Okay, so I can now, I know, I, as, a, uh, as I said before, whenever I do any code changes, it kind of uh, recompiles and reloads my application. So if I now look for Sane, voila, I see what I expected. I see only my, my, uh, my uh, the expected results. Okay, so, um, doo -doo -doo. so this is what I wanted to show you as far as uh, demos are concerned. So let me, um, I go back to the presentation because as with anything, life is not perfect. There are still some things that are some limitations about Elm that is important to know about them. Now, one thing that Elm does not have is doesn't have type classes. So type classes are this kind of weird uh, kind of uh, terms that uh, functional programmers use like monads, uh, functors, applicatives, what people struggle a lot with. Um, so Elm does not have any of those. So it's like a Haskell without type classes. What does this mean? It means several things. A, it's much easier to learn Elm than any other Haskell-like programming languages that you'll ever find. It makes it super easy to learn. It means it has amazing compiler errors that are really easy to figure out what are the problems. So it, even if you're a total beginner with Elm, it can really by reading the, low, the error messages, you can really get, uh, get to having code. However, there are some problems with it. It's because you don't have type classes, you don't have a way to kind of abstract common code that easily. So it means you can end up writing more boilerplate code that say with one that supports type classes. And one of the areas where you see this problem a little bit appearing is like with the dictionary type. So in um, there's this type which is a dictionary, which is like a key value, uh, map. Now, Elm supports dictionary types that have uh, uh, keys that are comparable. So comparable is kind of their own kind of internal type class that you you cannot have any of your own types implement that. So you can only support uh, keys that are either um, uh, that are primitives or they are tuples of primitives, etc. So this is a limitation. Uh, but uh, Elm uh, has, or Elm creators, and Evan in particular, says this is something that we're happy to live with for now. Some people are not so happy about it. Some people have blocked about it. Some people have really gone like super crazy about it. But uh, I think it's a limitation. As long as you are aware of it, then that's fine. It, there's no need to make it like a blown up issue. Um, one of the things they change in uh, 0 0.17 is they make they made um, a bit less FRP-like. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, so one of the things they had before at the beginning with them is the ability to uh, communicate between different Elm palms using signals like events. So this part went away, uh, which means whenever commu when any communication, you need to do that through subscriptions now, which is maybe a little bit more um, um, it requires more work, but at the same time, by removing the signals part, it made it um, easier to learn. So they kind of gave up a little bit of the flexibility, but they made it the language much easier. Now, another important thing to, to know about Elm is that you often need to interact with other JavaScript libraries. So Elm itself, it basically compiles that to JavaScript, and then it, it, it 
Elm itself is the sole owner of the DOM. So whenever you need, you need your app to interact with JavaScript, you basically need to create uh, this kind of ports or kind of entry points for, for the uh, JavaScript libraries. So if you have big dependencies on JavaScript libraries, then you have to create a lot of ports, which becomes a bit tedious. Um, now, if any of this is a limitation for you, of course, you've got Angular, you've got React, uh, but if you're still kind of keen on the uh, functional part, there's something called PureScript, which is a kind of a more general purpose uh, language, which is uh, closer to Haskell, so it has type classes and things like that, and it also compiles to JavaScript. But uh, I personally find it quite uh, complex, so I, st I prefer to, to kind of work with um, for the demos that I, that, that I write. So that's pretty much all I had to say today. So I said at the beginning we, want to, we wanted to learn a little bit how to write a functional reactive application. And uh, we've seen how functional reactive applications are those that follow the functional reactive programming principles. We looked a little bit what is uh, FRP, what is it useful, that it makes our uh, systems easier to compose and um, how those uh, systems are asynchronous by default, so they're always dealing with events, they don't have to uh, wait for things. Uh, we've looked at how to build a little kind of sample uh, functional reactive application, and uh, we've seen how we can uh, kind of do a bit of live coding and implement some parts and see what, what happened. Um, so to finish, I wanted to thank these amazing people that let me use uh, these uh, icons. And uh, if you want to know more about this application, or if you want to try it at home, there is a, I have a repo with this application, which is over there. Um, after the talk, I'll be uh, posting the slides on the speaker deck, and I'll be tweeting about it. So you don't need to take a picture uh, necessarily right now. If you want to know about, uh, more about Elm, you can go to m-lang.org. Uh, if you want to know more about InfiniSpan, I haven't really talked much about InfiniSpan right now, but um, the, you can go onto our website. Um, and yeah, we also have a supported version of a memory data grid called Jabos Data Grid, so if you want to know more about uh, that offering. And that's all I had to ask, uh, to say, so I've got about seven or eight minutes for questions. And if there are no, if there are no questions, I'm going to show you more things, so you decide. Yeah. Okay, who has a question? Wants to start? Is everyone no in Spain no so questions. shy? No questions. Didn't know. Come on. Guys, let's, right, let's, let's show you some stuff then. Uh, you chose it, okay? So. <laughs> um, so, right, let's go back to my application, right? As I told you, we were talking earlier that we have three nodes, right? So, with, as you see, I, had a, I ended up with my system containing two nodes, two events, right? So you see right now, it's picked these two nodes here, and the yellow one, okay, to store it. So let's see what happens if I kill one of them, right? Let's go for the four to two, right? Uh, uh, uh. Let's do, uh, I know that this one is in an offset of 200, so I can just go and kill this node. Right. Well, let's see what happens. Uh. <gasps> Voila! Let's go and then re uh, reshuffle the data. So as you see, we killed one of the nodes, so we wanted to maintain two copies of data, right? So it's ended up splitting the data over to the other nodes. And if we go back to our application, um, should be uh, still working fine. We completely, we still see the events that we saw earlier. I'm going to still look for data. No problem. Okay. That's it. That's all I had to show you. If you have any questions, uh, just ping me. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming.